This video is made possible by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. Sign up for less than $15 a year and you can watch extended and ad-free cuts of all BioArk videos on Nebula. Termites have stomachs like New York City, dense and incredibly diverse. Their gut flora includes bacteria, archaea, and protozoa, and this microbial cocktail gives them a superpower. They can digest the polysaccharides found in dead wood that few other animals can. This superpower is not so super, however, for people who live in wooden buildings. Each year, termites cause $30 billion of damage in the United States alone, but they compensate for the destruction they wage on buildings by being prolific architects themselves. Most termites make their nests underground or in rotting wood like decaying logs, dilapidated buildings, or George Washington's denture collection buried beneath the Washington Monument. Many species will just live in these underground or wooden tunnels, but some species also will build mounds. Mounds are clumps of coconut covered in dark chocolate, whereas almond joys are covered in milk chocolate and also have a joyous almond inside of them. A termite mound, on the other hand, is typically devoid of any chocolate, coconut, and tragically almonds. It's the part of a nest that protrudes from the surface, and protrude they do. Relative to their size, termites construct the world's largest structures. Termites in the genus Macrotermes build complex mounds that often reach 8 to 9 meters, or 26 to 29 feet high. The tallest one ever recorded was almost 13 meters high, which is even taller than a Hummer limo is long. If we scaled termites and their nests up to the size of humans, then this gigantic mound would be like a building twice the height of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, humanity's tallest building. These monstrosities can take up to five years for the termites to build, but that's no matter because termite monarchs are the longest living insects. The oldest will live for up to 50 years, meaning that many will reign longer than most human monarchs do. Termite colonies are socially structured like you social ants and bees, although they're more closely related to cockroaches. The queen or queens lay eggs as their hundreds or potentially millions of children serve them as soldiers and workers who work together to create these incredible structures. Despite how impressive many of these mounds are, remarkably, not much living actually happens in them. The bulk of the living will still take place in an extensive network of underground tunnels beneath the mound. So what's the point of them? Well, well, first of all, they're used to protect the colony's soft, squishy bodies from enemies. Unfortunately, many termites accidentally built mounds that perfectly accommodate the slender snout and tongue of anteaters, so they do the exact opposite of protecting their residents. If you scaled up an anteater attacking a termite colony along with the termites and nests all to human size, it would be like anteater Kong, the height of the Washington Monument, was attacking the Empire State Building. Besides, mounds don't offer much additional protection than just digging underground or into wood does, so it isn't really their main job. What they're really there for is absolutely fascinating. They act like an HVAC system. One of the most clear examples of termites using their mounds for thermoregulation is the compass termite. Unfortunately, they're honestly kind of ugly. They're basically just slabs. Fields of them look sort of like graveyards, which is the last thing you want to see if you're lost in the outback. But I'm not criticizing them. Compass termites have the same philosophy with their architecture as I do when I put on my best pair of Velcro sneakers. Practical over pretty. The way they build their ugly slabs is important. They orient the long side along the north-south axis so they point north, like a compass, which is why they have the name compass termite. This means that most of the surface area of their slabs face east and west, which means they're mostly exposed to the more subdued morning and evening sun. The harsh midday sun, on the other hand, shines on the thin top of the slab so it doesn't absorb as much heat. This architectural choice keeps the nest at a stable temperature throughout the day, and slab isn't the only architectural style that can help termites thermoregulate their nest. For example, this one is made out of tubes and they're called chimneys. This shape is called a cathedral, which means that the reigning termite monarch inside must be a bishop. Cathedral mounds are a conglomeration of tube-like chimneys. Thin chimneys surround wider core chimneys. A top-down view of the chimneys would be like a sketch of a daisy. The chimneys can be capped or their tops can be left open, and this affects how air flows throughout the nest. If chimneys are closed off, termite Santa might have a hard time escaping. But that doesn't mean that heat can't escape or get redistributed throughout the nest. During the day, the thin outer chimneys heat up more quickly than the central ones. So, warm air from the colony rises up while the cool air in the central tubes falls. During night, this flow reverses. 
The outer chimneys cool off, while the central tubes stay warm, so the warm air rises up the middle, while cool air falls down the outer chimneys. Mounds built in the shade with more stable temperatures throughout the day tend to have shorter and thicker walls, while walls built out in the open have taller and thinner walls. Following this logic, we can only assume that a termite mound built inside of the sun would have infinitely tall walls that are infinitesimally thin. It is incredible that termites have figured out how to harness the daily temperature cycle. But, actually, some argue that airflow isn't for thermoregulation. Instead, it acts more like a lung or a ventilation system. Think about it. A nest can be home to potentially millions of termites. Not only can it get warm, but the air inside of there can get as foul as a middle school boy's locker room. But the nest isn't polluted by Axe body spray, but instead by CO2 and methane gas that are the byproducts of the bugs breathing and, well, farting. With the help of the daily temperature cycle, the mound makes its nest inhale fresh air and exhale polluted air. The thin walls of the outer chimneys are slightly porous, so air can squeeze through. The walls act like a semi-permeable membrane, and you know what that means. Methane, CO2, oxygen, and other gases do everybody's favorite thing, osmosis. If there's more CO2 and methane in the nest than there is outside, it will seep out of the nest as the air circulates around the chimneys, and oxygen will enter the same way. If chimneys are open-topped, the way ventilation works is even more straightforward. If you watched my video about the stunning architecture of prairie dog burrows, you will already be familiar with this. It's called the Venturi Effect. Essentially, winds blow faster the higher up you are from the ground. So, if a mound has chimneys in addition to openings at ground level, the wind will be blowing at slightly different speeds at each of the entrances. This creates pressure differentials, so air will be sucked into the lower openings and then flow out of the higher chimneys, creating a nearly constant flow of air throughout the mound. Fresh air will simply be replenished during circulation. Some human architects hope to harness termite techniques for building their own skyscrapers, especially when it comes to ventilation. For example, the Eastgate Center in Harare, Zimbabwe. Like termite mounds, its outer concrete walls are porous. As wind blows through them, the concrete absorbs the heat, thus cooling the wind before it whooshes down into the shopping center below. At night, fans will flush heat out of the concrete, so it'll be ready to absorb more heat the next day. This enables the shopping center to use only about 10% of the energy that a typical building of a similar size would use. However, we definitely couldn't use every termite building technique since the bugs make their mounds out of a conglomeration of dirt, spit, dung, and half-digested plant matter. A skyscraper made like that wouldn't pass any health inspections. So how exactly do termites construct these mounds? Do they just plop spitballs willy-nilly? Well, sorta. There is actually some rhyme and reason behind it, but nothing like the extensive planning of human-made buildings. They're cobbled together kind of like a conga line. Termites do this thing called self-organization. Each termite is pre-programmed to perform a few basic behaviors. The building behavior loop goes something like this. A termite picks up a dirt or dung particle, mixes it up with their spit, and then cements the glob in place. This termite is like the first guy at a wedding reception who decides to grab onto someone's shoulders. Soon enough, another worker comes comes and deposits her own spitball next to the first one, then another, like more and more partiers adding themselves to the conga line. Eventually, the conga line gets too long or the construction site gets too traffic jammed. When this happens, the builders disperse and go about their days like how humans move on from doing a conga line to betting how long it'll be until the bride and groom get a divorce. It's still unclear exactly how termites know when and where to build, however. It might be pheromone signals. Termites might engrave hieroglyphics into the spitballs for all I know. One emerging theory is that termites are extremely sensitive to moisture, which helps them when building and also sussing out if any of their siblings wet their pants. For instance, it's thought termites will only deposit their spitballs next to a patch with a specific moisture content. This, however, has proven difficult to test since termites tend to attack any sensing probes that invade since wires do kind of look an awful lot like an anteater's tongue. So it's hard to say for sure if humidity is ultimately what guides the building behavior of termites, but it could have far-reaching effects on mound building. The same way that beavers hear running water and then go repair their dams, termites could detect that their nest is too dry or too humid and then go in patch holes or thicken walls. We could stand to learn an awful lot from these incredible bugs. I personally would like them to teach me how to eat wood. 
One thing I do know about eating wood is that it's hard to eat when it's limp. You might think soggy wood would be easier to eat, but come on, it just flops everywhere. Just like it's hard, I mean difficult, to talk to someone who has a limp brain. Whatever steps you're taking to impress your partner, don't let a limp brain get in the way. Viva Curiosity Stream and Nebula! Curiosity Stream is the world's premier educational streaming platform whose thousands of nonfiction and documentary titles can help you enjoy a more satisfying conversational experience. So, what do you do for work? I eat crayons and paper and mud. I watch the dozens of nature documentaries available on Curiosity Stream. My favorite is David Attenborough's Ant Mountain. If you like termites, you'll probably like ants too. This is what you do for work? Well, no, I'm unemployed. Viva Curiosity Stream and Nebula. The best part is, there's not even any need to ask a doctor, even if you have an unhealthy heart. You can enjoy Nebula and the dozens of original videos put out by your favorite smart indie creators. Ever since I started watching the Nebula originals like the logistics of D-Day by Real Engineering, or Real Life Lore's Modern Conflict series, well, my wife can't seem to keep her hands off of me. Thanks, Nebula! Side effects may include having fun, learning, and having something to talk about if you're stuck in an elevator with someone. Seek immediate medical help for an erection lasting more than four hours. Thank you so much for watching. Please click on the button that's on screen right now to sign up for both for less than $15 a year and see every Biowork video early and ad-free and an extended version of this video. And as always, thank you so much for watching.